What is she doing here? Nuclear energy isn't sustainable or clean. This accusatory statement came from a woman in the audience when I was speaking at COP22 in Morocco last year. She stood up, pointed her finger at me when I was starting my presentation, and then stormed out of the room. Didn't give me a chance to finish what I was talking about or defend my position. This year at the upcoming climate change talks, COP23 coming up in Germany starting next week, the UN Environmental Program, UNEP, denied sponsorship to the World Nuclear Association on the grounds that they didn't feel comfortable in including nuclear energy in their side event. Me and my company were going to contribute to this sponsorship and won't be attending that event now, next week. This kind of technology bias and tribalism is something I've experienced recently as I've become more involved in the clean energy sector, trying to promote our technology in nuclear. And while there's a long history in why environmentalists and nuclear energy seem to be at odds with each other, first I'd like to start a little bit with my own history. So my name is Lenka. People often ask me where I'm from because although I have an American accent, my name is a little bit different. Uh, when I was young, my parents and I were refugees to the US from the former, so former Soviet Union um, in Slovakia. We decided to leave um, and came to the US, and I grew up in between two different cultures that I was always trying to bridge the gap of. My Eastern European family tends to be very um, reserved and cynical, whereas Americans are very positive and kind of have this like go-getter entrepreneurial attitude. So I was never 100% Slovak or 100% American and felt like I needed to bridge this gap, but always feeling different and not belonging anywhere. So I decided to become a cynical entrepreneur, I guess you could say, um, <laughs> in between the two cultures. Now, being, being different uh, growing up, I was not afraid to be different in my career. So naturally, when I went to college, I decided to be a nuclear engineer, not something that most people do. Um, I took a nuclear engineering seminar freshman year, and I was really inspired by the technology, not just for electricity production, but also for how we can use it in medical applications such as medical imaging or even curing cancer, agricultural applications for irradiating food so it can last longer, and even for space exploration. And throughout school, I thought, this technology is amazing and we use it every day in our lives, even in smoke detectors in our homes, but most people don't know much about it and are even afraid of it. So throughout school, although I was studying engineering and got to do really cool things like operate this nuclear reactor at Purdue, um, I decided to focus much more on the communication and policy side because this is where we were struggling in nuclear energy. And I found myself, again, bridging this gap between the technology and policy. My dad was also an engineer. Uh, this is a picture of the Bohunice nuclear power plant back in Slovakia. It's right outside of the town of Trnava, where my family is from. My dad worked in city planning, and he worked on a project to bring the excess heat from this nuclear power plant to the city during the winter months in order to heat the buildings, a very energy efficient process. We were also environmentalists at home growing up. Um, we were the first people I knew to have solar panels on our house. My first car was a hybrid. And my dad was constantly finagling with our water heater and our air conditioning system to make sure we weren't paying for any electricity. We were basically doing energy efficiency and demand response before it was cool. <laughs> I didn't think it was that cool back then. <laughs> and another thing he always told me was to not believe in the environmentalists in the US, that they were anti-technology, anti-nuclear energy, and their protests against nuclear power plants in the 70s had caused more coal plants to be built. Now, I think that the intentions of environmentalists were the best at the time, and I don't think that the nuclear energy industry did their best to include communities in the process and to make sure that people were a part of the decisions that were being made. And so these two tribes formed. And as Yuval Noah Harari says in his book, Sapiens, evolution has made homo sapiens, like other social mammals, a xenophobic creature. Sapiens instinctively divide humanity into two parts, we and they. But this kind of tribalism isn't going to help us solve the world problems that we face. And the energy sector and technology sector can help us solve these problems. 
from bringing the 1.2 billion people still without electricity, bringing them electricity, and bringing billions others out of energy poverty to getting rid of the pollution in developing economies and bringing the millions of people that still don't have it access to clean water and refrigeration for their food. The US, uh, the Energy Information Administration predicts that our energy demand will rise by 28% um, through 2040, and that three quarters of this energy demand will still be fulfilled by fossil fuels. I think that we can do better than this, and I hope that we do for the sake of our planet and our human population. So we need to continue um, the trend that we're on and even increase it in terms of the exponential growth that we're having in renewables, which is amazing but we're going to need a lot more in order to decarbonize, not just our electricity system, but transportation, industry, and heating. And so I'd like to introduce some of the seemingly unpopular technologies that are out there that we need to be embracing a little bit more and including as a part of the conversation. The first one is carbon capture utilization and sequestration. This is an important technology because there are quite a few industrial processes, one of them being cement manufacturing, that makes carbon as just a byproduct. So in order to decarbonize that process, we're going to need carbon capture. We also still heavily depend on fossil fuels, so this can be a transition to help us decarbonize in the near term. Second is hydrogen. This is something where I saw a presentation from Bloomberg earlier this year in which the speaker said, hydrogen cars are dead and electric vehicles are the only way forward. However, there's huge companies like Air Liquide, Shell, Toyota, and Honda that are investing in hydrogen infrastructure and fuel cell cars, even right here in the Bay Area. They estimate that 13% of world energy demand could come from hydrogen by 2050, and this would avoid 7.5 gigatons of carbon emissions annually. This is a huge potential reduction and a technology that we could be embracing more and including as part of the conversation. The problem is that most hydrogen today is made from natural gas, so we're going to need another clean energy source to help us produce all this hydrogen. Which brings me to my favorite unpopular technology, nuclear. There it is, it's providing 20% of our electricity today, 60% of our carbon-free electricity in this country, but it has some baggage. There's the nuclear waste, uh, which can be recycled, by the way. And then just the word nuclear brings fear and public opposition. Marianne Williamson, a famous lecturer, said, the opposite of love is not hate, but fear. We're afraid of the things that we don't understand. So I challenge you to get out of your clean tech comfort zone and learn about some other technologies and continue to embrace other people in the conversation. You might be surprised by what you find. My company, New Skill Power, is developing a small modular nuclear reactor that will essentially change the way we see nuclear energy. The modules are produced in a factory and then shipped on site to be fueled and plugged in to generate electricity. We are making nuclear energy far more cost effective and efficient and flexibly operated to the point where we could flexibly operate these plants to load follow with wind and enable rather than compete with wind power on the grid. We can also provide uh, we can also provide energy for mission critical facilities such as data centers and, and other industrial processes like oil refining, hydrogen production, and even desalinate water um, for those people that still don't have clean water and for those that already rely on desalination but are now doing it with fossil fuels. Advanced nuclear technologies are taking care of some of the, or alleviating some of the issues that we've had with nuclear energy including it needing to be operated as a baseload energy source, the safety issues, as well as the waste issues. Some advanced reactors can even use waste as fuel. Getting more involved in the clean energy or clean tech community has caused me to challenge my own assumptions about the energies and the technologies that I believe in, and I'll learn a lot from you that are here. The editor of Green Tech Media, Stephen Lacey, says it perfectly. The tribal warfare that is so common in debates about the low carbon energy transition has burned me out. After watching and participating in these debates over the years, feeling like I always need to have the right answer, I've come to believe they are more about posturing than addressing the hard realities of energy. 
I've fallen victim to this tribalism in the past. However, as I realized over the years how difficult it will be to serve 9 billion people with cheap, clean, abundant energy, I want to open up myself to more op ideas on how to do that, not less. As women in clean tech and women in a male-dominated field, we're used to being different. So, and we're also used to bringing the human aspect into technology. So as I tell my own peers in nuclear energy to get out of our echo chamber and learn about other things, go to clean tech conferences, I also challenge you to get out of your comfort zone and your echo chamber of the sector that you work in. I may have not convinced you on the merits of nuclear energy today. That would take a little bit more than a 10-minute talk. But I hope that you're at least willing to learn from me and, and ask me questions. And I hope to learn something from you in return. Thank you.